Hey, I'm Tan Tan. Welcome back. I'm working on this voxel game and I recently decided to completely ditch the Unity game engine and basically reboot my entire game development process. It's for a multitude of reasons, but one of them is the Rust programming language, which I just miss it every time I use any other programming language. I feel like I'm growing as a programmer when I use it, and that is what I want to create my voxel game in. Last episode we created a voxel engine, and that was pretty rad. We had some cool world generation, different colors, but it was painfully slow sometimes. Loading the chunks in always frees the frames, and that's bad. So today, we're gonna optimize the code. We gotta go fast. Yeah. We gotta go fast. Optimize the code. We gotta dissect, detect the slow functions that are rolled with a profile too. Yeah, it's gonna be so cool. <laughs> okay, enough of that. One reason not to use a game engine is, well, you have complete control over the entire program. If the game lags, then, well, it's it's completely your fault. And, yeah, it's a problem at this moment, so that is all I've been doing the last two weeks. Only optimizing code. And uh, that may sound really boring, but honestly, it has been very interesting. First, we're gonna take a look on how the world generation works. And then we're gonna see how I managed to optimize my game engine. We're gonna compare the Unity version to this version. And I'm gonna share the knowledge I learned along the way. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, strap on your seatbelt, smash the like button, and let's jump right into it. This is a block, or rather a voxel. To create a world out of these, we spawn these voxels in a chunk. Minecraft chunks are 16 by 16 by 256, and it scales endlessly on the X and Z axis, but the Y axis is fixed. In my voxel engine, chunks are 32 by 32 by 32, and the world is infinite in every direction, even up and down. The way my world generation works is it has quite a lot of steps. Let's see how a single chunk is generated. Using a voxel's position in a chunk, we can use a noise function to basically figure out if a block is solid or if it's an air block. Let's call it chunk data. To render this data to the screen, I'm generating meshes. The mesh generation uses this chunk data to figure out where to place the vertices of the mesh. The chunk data isn't really that necessary after the mesh has been created. This data is just used as a building block to create this mesh. So you might think we don't need this data after creating the mesh. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that because the mesh generation part needs adjacent chunk data to figure out how the edges of a chunk should look like. So what needs to be done is to have a way to handle this chunk data and mesh data. Now, I'm not gonna dive that deep into when this data is loaded or unloaded, but you should be aware that I'm dealing with chunk data and mesh data separately. We are, however, going to look into the data crunching part to see how I optimized generating these separate parts. To create a single chunk, all we need to do is call a Perl noise value 32,000 times. That is a pretty fast operation to do. But generating the mesh is a very expensive operation. To just figure out where to place vertices, we need to sample three adjacent voxels for every single voxel. That is sampling the voxel data 131,000 times per chunk. That's just sampling the data. By sampling adjacent voxels, we can figure out where the block face should be placed. In this case, where the current block we're shaking is solid, if the voxel left to this block is an air block, that means we should place a quad to the left side. The process quad function will push these vertices into a list of vertices. And in the end we get a mesh. Now this code is a bit much to go through, but the underlying mechanic is we're sampling a hash map many times, and there's a chance we'll push position data into a vector, and this is what we have to optimize. An unfortunate reality is we can't really change the algorithm too much because well, every part is necessary. So, how do we speed this up? Well, multithreading. Now, multithreading gives us a good speed boost, but that doesn't mean we can generate a hundred chunks in one frame. It makes sense to divide all of the data crunching over multiple frames. I decided to implement a queue with the chunk positions that I want to load in. I populate this queue every frame, and with a variable I can decide how many chunks we can queue up per frame. And BAM! The game no longer lags, but the world generation is pretty slow now. We fixed the FPS lag spikes, but the world generation is underwhelmingly slow, so let's look into the multithreading part. Never having done any multithreading in Rust, I spent countless of hours over multiple days researching multithreading. I watched hours-long lectures, read articles, 
of the brain you bits overwhelmed. I decided to just pick a multi-threading library and stick with it. I decided to try out this library called Rayon. The biggest feature of this library is parallel iterators. Take any for loop you've written, change iter to poor iter, and just like that, Rayon will in some magical way figure out the fastest way to iterate this loop. Rayon will manage the threads and delegate the work between them with a the work stealing technique. What does all of that mean? Uh, I don't know, but I wanna imagine some threads working a bit faster than others and they're basically sharing the tasks among themselves. It's not always as simple as just changing iter to par iter. In this example we iterate 0 to 99 and each loop we try to push a boolean into a vector. This is completely fine to do in a single thread, but when we introduce a par iter, the lambda for the for loop now has a chance to be executed in another thread, and the Rust compiler forces you to write thread safe code. Accessing a vector from multiple threads can be very very bad. Now the Rust compiler sees that and tells us we're not allowed to mutate this state over multiple threads. So I had to refactor all of my vertices generation code. There are multiple ways you can tackle this issue. One of the most famous ways to do this is to utilize a mutex which makes sure only one thread at a time can access and mutate the data. But that's not the solution I went with. I decided to utilize a MPSC, Multi Producer Single Consumer. The idea is that all the working threads will generate this vertex data and instead of pushing it into a vector, this data is sent like a message to a receiver. The concept sounds good, uh, I don't know how it works in the background. From what the documentation is telling me, sending this data is a non-blocking operation, which is just what we want. With the mutex way of doing things, the threads had to wait for one another to access the vector, but using a MPSC, the threads can send their stuff immediately to a receiver. I don't know how it works in the background, but it's it works. <laughs> That's all I care about. Now, multi-threading is pretty new to me, as you might have figured out. So take everything I say here with a grain of salt. I'm learning all of this along the way. So, we went from loading all the chunks at once to then implementing a form of queue that divides the work over multiple frames, to now basically parallelizing, is that a word? Parallelizing? To now parallelizing the data generation and mesh generation code with multi-threading. The code that generates these worlds are much faster now, and we can now crank up the amount of chunks we process each frame. A very valuable tool I'm using to test how fast the code is, is a profiler called Optic, and a benchmarking tool called Criterion. Nick Creative from my Discord group, by the way, link in the description, helped me out with some benchmarking. We found that the noise library I was using at first was about 10 to 20 times slower than another library, so I switched over to that other library, thanks to benchmarking it with Criterion. This is a really cool benchmarking tool. It can generate a website with the results from your benchmarks, which I thought was really cool. I haven't fit all of my code into Criterion benchmarks because that seems like a lot of work. So using the profile optic instead, that's what I used to see how fast my functions were. So let's actually look on the data. How slow was my code before I added multi-threading? For this test, I'll set it so data generation happens 32 times a frame and mesh creation happens 8 times a frame. To try out the single thread method, I'm just gonna remove the power iter, just like that. That's all we need to do to make it single threaded, nice. And to profile this, with optic you start collecting data whenever you want. And then we can dissect, we're gonna dissect, detect the slow functions that are rolled with a profiler tool. Here is the result for the single threaded methods. Generating the data took a total of 14 milliseconds and that is an average of 0.4 milliseconds per chunk. Generating the mesh took a total time of 62.7 milliseconds. That's an average of 7.8 milliseconds per chunk. 62 milliseconds to create the mesh, that is pretty slow. Let's see how fast the multi-threaded version is. Generating the data took a total time of 8.3 milliseconds. We can already see a double in improvement almost. We had an average of 0.2 milliseconds. Generating the mesh took a total time of 18.7 milliseconds. That's more than 3 times faster. And that is an average of 2.3 milliseconds per chunk. This is a really good improvement for the chunk generation and this is such a fatal part of the game, the world creation. And now, it's a lot faster. That is great. 
With the current multi-threading performance, I tested out different settings and my computer, being a pretty old computer, can handle 32 chunk data per frame and 8 chunk meshes per frame with an okay FPS. Here is my computer stats, it's probably an average computer in today's standards. A problem with having this queue amount fixed is that when we get more gameplay into the game, things like physics, AI, maybe the world generation needs to slow down a bit. Or if you have a really fast computer, it would be nice if the world generation could crank out these meshes even faster. I'm not sure how I'm going to solve this in the future, but we can probably assume this is not the final version of the world generation. I'm probably gonna change this code a lot. Anyway, let's compare my voxel engine to the Unity version. I'm gonna use the demo for the voxel library I was using in my Unity version of this game. And in a pretty unscientific method, we're just gonna see how fast the chunks load in. Unscientific because the world is generated looking differently. So, yeah. Have I wasted all my time creating this Rust version? Or is it faster than the Unity version? Let's find out. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Mine's much slower. Why? What have I done to deserve this? My code? It sucks. Yeah, that kind of stings a little bit. The Unity version is about two times faster than the Rust version. Now, I used the Unity version to model my own version. Of course, it's not an exact replication of the Unity version, but double the speed? Really? I have some suspicions, but we're not gonna investigate that today because it's already taking me so long time to make this video. I believe my Rust version has a lot of sleeping time in the game loop. My game loop is set up exactly how the Winit default example is set up. And I believe with that, there's a lot of sleeping time waiting for other frames. But the verdict is, for now, the Rust version is a little bit slower than the Unity version. Um, segwaying into some other stuff. So, Blugatrof left a very nice comment uh, talking about his experience creating a voxel engine. And he mentioned data compression. So, I decided to dive into that, and um, this is what happened. We all know optimizing for speed is a good thing to do, but data storage can also be a very important thing to optimize. Just looking out over all these meshes we had to create, this takes up storage, believe it or not. Let's do a little bit of math to see how big of a difference data compression can do to lower the memory usage. This entire scene we're looking at is mostly made out of vertices. A vertex has a position, normal, and a color. This world has 4 million vertices, and this data is stored on the GPU. The position is represented with 3 floats, x, y, z, and they take up a total of 12 bytes. We also has a normal, another 12 bytes, and the color, which I only store the red, green, and blue values, not the alpha, that's another 12 bytes. Every single vertex takes up 36 bytes of storage, and that is 147 million bytes in this scene, which is about 150 megabytes. To be honest, I thought it would be a lot more, but oh, oh well, we're still gonna see how we can compress this data down to a much smaller number. Instead of storing world positions of the voxel, we could store the local position within the chunk. A chunk is 32 by 32 by 32, so we know the local position will never exceed the bounds 0 to 32. This is how many bits we need to represent the value going from 0 to 32. That is only 6 bits. Currently, the position is stored with a float for each dimension, and the float takes up 32 bits of memory. Can't we just fit all of these 6 bits into one single float? Why, yes we can. You could probably use a float, but it makes more sense now to use a 32-bit unsigned integer instead. Doing this, we reduce the size from 12 bytes to just 4 bytes for the position. But wait! Are there more things we can fit into this single 32-bit unsigned integer? Well, yes. We are only taking up 18 bits right now, and we have a spare 14 bits to enjoy. Can we fit something else in here? Yes, the normal. The normal is used for lightning calculations. It's just a direction. So this is how a normal of a voxel currently looks like. And we can already see similarities. They all point in similar directions. 
directly to the left, straight up, straight forward. There are only six variations of a normal. Well, how many bits do we need to represent six variations? Three bits. Three bits gives us a value between zero and seven. So we can actually fit this normal data into the same unsigned integer we're using for the position. It's pretty crazy. How this works programmatically I'm not gonna get into because this is a pretty large topic. But if you wanna know how all of this is done, you should research bitwise operations and just learn more about data types. A side effect of doing bitwise operations is harder code to read. This is my shader code for drawing the voxel vertices. The position is extracted like this. And to get the normal, we get an index, you know, 0 to 6, and that is mapped to an internal variable in the shader. I need to keep track of all of these numbers. 0 is a normal pointing to the left, number 3 is pointing up. There is a trade-off in readability to optimization sometimes. But at the end of the day, we save this much data. With data compression, our world only takes up 65 megabytes. That's a reduction in almost 100 megabytes. Very nice! I haven't even looked into optimizing the color data. That may reduce the data even more. Believe it or not, I actually had a lot more to talk about, but this video is already way too long, so we're gonna wrap it up right here. Coming up, I'm gonna focus on improving the engine. I wanna focus a little bit on adding a debug menu, so that is going to be super interesting. Also, thank you guys for 4,000 subscribers. Let me celebrate that for a moment. <laughs>